All right, it is 12.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. How's it going? Yay. <laughs> Welcome to um, our panel, the uh, 90s zine revolution panel. Um, my name is Dr. Rachel Miller. Uh, I graduated from OSU with a PhD. Sometimes I joke that I have a PhD in comics, but that's not exactly true. Um, <laughs> my PhD is in English, but I specialize in zines and mini comics. So I'm super excited to be here today with a group of cartoonists who know all about this. Um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So I guess we can just start with uh, Megan Kelso. If you want to go ahead and int introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, and thanks for inviting me, Rachel. Uh, my name's Megan Kelso, and I'm from Seattle, Washington. And I started drawing comics in my last year of college at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. And uh, I didn't really know what I was doing, um, but I always had liked to draw and write stories. And I had a boyfriend who said, you should draw comics, <laughs> and kept giving me comics to look at. And, and in the meantime, everyone in Olympia suddenly was either starting a band or making a zine. So it was a kind of fruitful environment. And um, I started making comics, and it just was an aha moment for me. I am really lucky. I was 22 years old, and I realized, wow, this is, this is what I want to do. And so I've been drawing comics ever since. I, so I started out self-publishing, and I didn't, um, I never heard the word mini comic, but uh, I was told later that's what I was doing. I thought I was making a zine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but now uh, I'm published by Fanographics, and my fourth book just came out. It's debuting here at SPX. It's a collection of five short stories, and um, it's called Who Will Make the Pancakes? Awesome. Welcome, Megan. Thanks. Um, OK, I'll introduce myself next. Hi, everyone. Um, and also, I'd like to thank you, Rachel, for uh, hosting this. It's a very special moment to be here with mm -hmm. these folks. Um, I haven't been to an SPX for uh, a whole bunch of years. And um, so this is exciting. A <laughs> uh, uh, little bit about myself. Um, <coughs> I hadn't really planned on like how I would talk on these panels or what I would say, but um, I got into um, comics, like reading comics pretty young, uh, Archie and stuff like that. Um, at some point when I was about 14, 15, um, I have a, a, a cool aunt who gave me um, a couple of really great comics, Neat Stuff and Love and Rockets. and that uh, just sort of got me hooked from there. Um, I would seek them out at, at Million Year Comics in Boston or wherever I could find them. And um, I went to art school kind of imagining that I would do like large format painting. That was sort of my dream. <laughs> and um, somehow organically did more and more comics-like things. Um, and then after graduating, uh, comics just I it was it, it, I don't I don't know how to describe like why like I didn't know what um, what many comics were either it's uh, just sort of fell into it because um, pen and paper was a cheap art supply thing that I could do at home and I think I did see a couple of Xerox comics around Boston before being like aware that there was zines and mini comics but yeah, eventually moved to San Francisco and kind of like hooked into this like thriving zine scene and um, met some cool people who helped me figure out how to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, well, thanks also, Rachel. Thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Hart. Um, I've stolen copies from Copy Max. University copy, Kinko's, <laughs> 43rd Street copy. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, 
as a teenager, I was always kind of making comics. I never really could get good at it. Short story, at tw 20 years old, I moved to Seattle, which is where all the cartoonists were. They were sort of huddled around Fanographics, which was based there, but all the uh, upcoming cartoonists were sort of going there too, and I wound up um, inserting myself into a little community with Megan and some others and just made tons and tons of comics. And uh, we talked about comics constantly and um, made zines and came to the first SPX, whenever the heck that was. And um, I've never stopped drawing. I keep making comics. Um, I've been published in a variety of ways, and, uh, and I run my own school for comics now. So that's the short version. Thanks. Hey, um, my name's Jenny Cervakis, and I started doing comics when I lived in Chicago when I was also 22 years old. And again, it was probably a confluence of arty people making zines and um, punk rock influences, things like that, but really it, it again had to do with my boyfriend at the time being into comics and us reading a ton of comics and being like, let's do comics too. <laughs> and um, one of the first things we did was making anthologies with lots of really cool people in it. Um, moved to Durham, North Carolina and continued to uh, do comics. Um, the comic I've been doing since 91 is called Strange Growths. And it's kind of a mix of like autobiographical dreams, poems, that kind of stuff. And one of the things I really liked about um, small press comics is that there wasn't really any restriction on what the subject matter was. So um, I just thought it was just wonderful. And um, I don't think I ever even considered doing comics before I started reading like more of like alternative like Harvey Picar or Seth Palookaville or Yummy Fur is before then I just thought um, I had a more restricted view I guess of what comics were like they were superheroes or they're Archie comics and I don't do those so um, anyways and I think also the reason why I think I stuck with it is that it's just a really good community um, I, like I was talking to you about how um, I did poetry slams and poetry stuff and there was a little bit of gatekeeping of people wanting, don't wanting their territory to be encroached on while it was like the opposite feeling when I did mini comics of people like, yeah, join us. <laughs> so it was a great feeling. So. That's awesome. And thank you all for being here today. I'm, I'm really excited to get to talk with you all. So. A couple of you have already kind of touched on this. Jenny, you kind of started talking about this, but I'm really interested, what, what is like your first memory of seeing a zine or a self-published comic? So um, I was living in Chicago at the time, and so Quimby's bookstore was there, um, and even closer to where I lived was a place called Earwax, which was a combination bookstore, record store, coffee shop, and also sold zines, and um, they would actually, like, you know, I could give them my zines, and they would put it in their little zine corner. Um, and one of the first uh, people we actually corresponded with was John Porcelino, um, who started doing King Cat, so, um, it, that, and that was through the mail. Or maybe we saw it in, at Quimby's, and we started exchanging uh, correspondence. I miss earwax a lot. I remember <laughs> it closed yeah. down right before I left Chicago, <laughs> and I was like, was Man. Cool <laughs> "Yeah." <laughs> but yeah, anyone else want to jump in? Real quick, the first one I ever saw was Sam Henderson, was an incredibly prolific comic, a uh, mini comic artist at the age of like 15 or something. And so I, I met him at 16, and I had done like four panels by that point. I was like, "Here's my comic," and he was like, "Here are my comics." <laughs> and, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, well, back then it was uh, Captain Spaz and um, Poot Poo Herman, Pert Herman, anyway, uh -huh. anyway, but so that sort of blew through my mind. I'm not, e I'm not even sure, like, I've tried to sort of dig back, like, what is my very first memory, but the first clear memory is, like, there was this little shop in Alston, which I can't, uh, in Alston, Mass, and I can't quite remember the name of it, but they did have, like, a rack of, um, mini comics and zines, and there were a couple of Boston cartoonists, I think maybe Seth Feinberg was one of them who had many, I'm not even 100% sure about that, but yeah, some in Alston is what I remember. 
Yeah, I, I did some work digging back trying to think about this. I figured this would be one of your questions. <laughs> and the first zines I saw were zines that, um, that bands made. Um, so I was going to college in Olympia, and I remember this band called Girl Trouble, and they, um, they put out a regular zine that they would hand out at shows. And then there was this other zine called Jigsaw, that this girl named Toby Vale did. And Toby later uh, was in Bikini Kill, but she was in another band before that, and I think that's when she started Jigsaw. And, um, you know, Xerox copying was just becoming, this is the late 80s, just becoming more available. And I remember I had a friend, a fellow student at Evergreen, who wanted, was inspired by these band zines and wanted to make one of those. And I remember talking to her one day and she said, I went to this place called Kinko's and it was like a wonderland. It was like 20 Xerox machines and you could just go up and use them, and this was not how the world had been before. You had to like know a dad in an office or something. <laughs> and she said, and there's like these work tables, and, and they let you use their glue sticks and their tape and their stapler. <laughs> and I was agog. I was like, what? And I think her saying that was what gave me the idea, like, because I was making these comics, but I didn't really know what I was going to do with them. And I think her saying that, like, you can go to this store and you don't have to get permission. You can just walk up to the copy machine, mm -hmm. kind of, like, gave me the, like, courage to think, okay, I, I can make one of these zines. So, yeah. I, unlike the rest of you, it was not a retail experience the first time I saw zines. It was, like, people handing them out. Oh, you help you help me like uh, resurface another memory of like my my first exposure to uh, Riot Girl was like one of the first scenes I've ever seen, and also I think I was in like Alston. I can't remember how I got it, um, but yeah, what like wasn't a comic, um, but yeah, and I, and I don't even know it was like some. I don't remember it was DC based, but I don't remember it having it was just called Riot Girl or something like that. I'm curious how soon. Um, Y'all discovered either Fact Sheet 5 or one of the other clearing houses and sharing magazines for that. Did you guys all do that? Pretty early on, I think. Yeah. I had like, I was looking back at my stuff and I had like 94, 95 Fact Sheet 5s. Mm. I think that's when it basically exploded. Mm. So it went from, you know, trading with your friends to people sending you $5 in the mail. And, uh, because they read a review in a magazine. Called, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. insane. I, it was at some point where I, I couldn't even keep up with correspondence because it would be multiple things a week, and it was something I was just doing as a hobby. <laughs> so it was Tom, I think you were the one who told me about Fact Sheet 5. Well, I would have learned everything from John Lewis. I learned everything from John Lewis about <laughs> Okay, that maybe John Lewis stuff. told yeah, me, but no, it was one possible. of the two yeah, of you. Yeah. I mean, I was yeah. very excited once I learned all this stuff and was a bit of a zealot, you know. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't really hooked into Fact Sheet Five. I think in San Francisco, it would have been in one of the stores when I moved there. That I, and I only had a couple of issues of it. I didn't like go out and buy it because most of my, it was mostly trading. Like I didn't have to like order anything. It was right. mostly like people send would send me something. I'd send them something in return. Um, but the the letters columns of comics like Hate um, were an, another place I was finding out about stuff. And you know, in in trying to like find some images for you, Rachel, I was reminded that it so Fact Sheet Five it was all about just listing like everything that was available, zine and mini comic wise. But there were lots of zines that like had their articles or stories or comics and then they would also have a little directory yeah, review of stuff section. review section yeah. or stuff they liked and there would also sometimes be like resource sections like mm -hmm. what stores or 
And it was, you know, pre-internet, so like that's how the information got around. Like, e not everybody, but a lot of different zine makers and comics makers would sort of take a little bit of responsibility for disseminating information. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah, I love this, uh, the plugs page from Deep Girl. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Always kind of sticks out in my mind because of those, um, yeah. the like headings are very distinctive, but. Yeah. <laughs> and very, then. Very cringy now when I look back at those, <laughs> like, and what I, like what I wrote. And <laughs> I know, toss, yeah. I remember like, in the sending a big long letter about how they were disappearing. That looks like a menu, that one. <laughs> yeah, this one's oh, a. Um, puppy toss, okay. The mm -hmm, puppy yeah. toss. Uh -huh. That was out of San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I went to like at least one, one or two puppy toss meetings, and those uh, hooked in with um, Gabby Gamboa and Dylan Williams. They were uh, uh, when I first moved to San Francisco, and I'm like fresh off the plane. What do I do in San Francisco? Um, uh, oh, I'm blanking. What's the name of the big um, comic book store comic there? Yeah, yeah that Comic Relief um, on Haight Street. Yeah, that mm. was it big intro and th then it would that was like that was like a big wonderland experience to me I'm mm -hmm. like wow there's there's tons of this stuff I must befriend these people <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of interested uh, just hearing you all talk um, and Megan you talked a little bit about like seeing going to Kinko's for the first time and seeing the Xerox machine and everything but when you guys um, started publishing, self-publishing comics, what was your process for that like? Because I think it's changed a lot um, over the years, and certainly I haven't seen a Kinko's in a long time, sadly. So I just wanted to hear more about that process of what putting together a zine or a mini comic was like for you all. Mine hasn't changed. I'm still doing <laughs> photocopy comics. <laughs> But I think I started out with typewriter paper and ballpoint pens uh, after penciling them in. And now I'm trying to graduate to slightly nicer pens, maybe, and sometimes ink. Um, do, you, do you do paste-ups? Do you paste up a, yeah. a master? Yeah, I mean, I, that's just what I'm comfortable with, you know, doing a mock-up of, it, you know, where you have the different pages and you send it through at um, <laughs> very lo-fi. Um, you all did paste-ups, I assume, too, right? You'd have a master copy, and you have, sh have a shrunk version of your artwork, and then you glue down, and then that becomes your master? Well, when I was a senior in high school, I, um, I was in this program at a local community college, like a vocational ed program. So I was at high school half the day, and then I went to the community college, and I was in this graphics and printing program. And I don't really know why I just thought it sounded cool mm -hmm. and so we we learned sort of the rules of typesetting and paste up and aligning everything and making half tones and using stat cameras which was how you prepared things for to be offset printed back then and we actually learned how to run printing presses so I don't know why I didn't go that route it was like it was like a detour before I started doing comics so when I started doing comics it was almost like I forgot that I knew that stuff mm -hmm. until I started to figure out well how do you put this thing together and then I realized like oh I learned all of this stuff in high school <laughs> um, but I actually didn't I didn't uh, stick with Xeroxing Girl Hero that long. I applied for a Zarek grant to self-publish pretty early on, and then I had the money to send it to a printer. But back then, you didn't send digital files. You still had to send the whole thing, all the originals, mm -hmm. to the printer. And so you did have to do some of that same graphic paste up of laying things out on paper. Um, so, yeah. That's fun. I still have my, like the first book I did that I sent to a printer is in a box this big that I had to send to Montana or something with ruby lith cover, which is a whole other topic. So the, the Kinko's I went to in Chicago was the same Kinko's that Dan Klaus used. So sometimes <laughs> I'd run into him and he would be making you know, like high quality reproductions to mail off to his publisher. Oh, yeah, so Brian Payne was the one of the people who worked there, and he did zines as well. So we would like trade. <laughs> so. 
once I got once I caught on to the tools that they had at Kinko's, like you mentioned, the glue stick and everything, and and um, I used lots of press type, like this is press type and press type. And once I got, once I learned about all the graphic design tools that were available that you could buy in an art store or something, I started making my covers sort of on the fly there at Kinko's. Sometimes like cutting things out, pasting. It was just real fun to start doing things that mm -hmm. way. Do any of you work digitally now, or have you kind of stuck? I know, um, Jenny, you said that you kind of, you still do the <laughs> everything kind of on paper and, you know, how you did it back in the 90s, so. So I, br I, I briefly learned a small amount of Photoshop just simply to scan in things for, it. so I have an anthology of the first 13 issues I've done of the comics, um, and so, yeah, I scanned those in and we cleaned them up and everything, but then I've kind of gone back to you know, doing things on paper. I, I really specifically don't like working digitally. Um, for a bunch of years, I was just using Photoshop to color uh, black and white line art, and um, and that's fine, and I still do that stuff occasionally, but I, I started getting into painting more because I, I just like working with my hands. I don't, I'm, I'm already on the computer screen all day for my day job, and yeah, um, and I part, wonder if that yeah, yeah. It has to do with it. It's because I have to be on a computer for my job, and I'm you know, staring at a screen. So for me, working with paper and pen and pencil is pleasurable to me, while doing something on a computer screen feels like work to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many people do so much beautiful stuff on the computer. I don't know. Yeah, the same for me too. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested, at the time, um, what do you all feel like self-publishing allowed you to express that maybe you wouldn't have been able to express if you were working with a publisher or working at you know one of the big, big two, DC, Marvel, et cetera? Um, what did self-publishing allow you to do with your comics that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise? Well, I often joke, like, I, I do comics so people will read my writing. <laughs> you know, just people don't read poems and things like that. It's like, what if I could put it in this comic format? That might make it more, like, appealing to people. So <laughs> that's part of why I did it. And just, like, I had just a bunch of little stories and stuff like that. And um, it, was, it was reading Harvey Pekar stuff that made me, like, light bulb moment of, like, whoa, he, hmm. he just does stories about regular life. You can do a comic about regular life. It's okay to do that, you know, so I thought that was a, a one to do. <laughs> I always just wanted to be creating stuff, and I think I just needed to be around other people creating stuff to do it, you know, like I, I didn't, I didn't really see publishers I, I saw them, they helped, I saw them as making distribution easy and, and certain certain parts of the process easier, but I just wanted to be around creators and I wanted to be a creator and it was just easier when I was with other creators. That's really what it was for me. I was, uh, I was very shy, like prior to making comics and once um, I did the first uh, issue, first or second issue of Deep Girl, I sort of discovered that I could get my like I could get my voice out there and say something in a way that I that I can't do in person. Like and um, yeah, so just kind of like communicating to the world that like I, I'm not just just like some dumb airhead. I'm a you know I'm a mm -hmm. human with thoughts. Um, that's what it allowed me to mm -hmm. do. <laughs> well, so. I didn't really read comics as a kid. I read newspaper strip comics, but I didn't read floppies. And so when I had this boyfriend who said, you should draw comics, he was showing me like Daredevil and I don't know, Frank Miller stuff. And it just didn't, it didn't really do much for me. And it wasn't until he started showing me like what Ariel saw, like neat stuff by Pete Bag, and then I and then he showed me Yummy Fur and Dirty Plot by Julie Doucet. Those were the comics that kind of made me have an aha moment. Like, oh, I love to I love to write stories. I love to draw, 
And I thought comics were like superhero comics. I just didn't really know that there was this more kind of personal way until I saw those. And then I tried doing it and I just knew like, yes, this is the medium for me. But I really, I mean, maybe it was being in Olympia um, where everybody was just, I mean, really just doing things themselves. It didn't really occur to me like, oh, I'll have more freedom if I self-publish versus less freedom if I go to a publisher. It really didn't occur to me that I would go to a publisher. It just seemed like a whole nother world that I wasn't, I didn't have access to. Um, and then when I moved to Seattle and I met Tom Hart and I met John Lewis and a bunch of other cartoonists, it was, it, it was sort of what Tom's saying. There was like this community of people all doing it themselves and, and um, sharing information and that just seemed like the way to go for many years. Yeah, we got together and we would have meetings where we would just be like, what'd you do this week? And we would show off our comics and it was just, it was, awesome, yeah, it was just a big uh, creator celebration every other week or I don't know, maybe we did those monthly. It seems like very collaborative how you guys are describing it um, in a way that maybe now making comics feels a little bit more isolated. Like we're all like chained to our drawing desks and working on our iPads type of thing, but. Yeah, but we're on Instagram constantly chatting with other creators, right? That's true, yeah. I mean, you have your Friday um, yeah. classes. I think that's awesome. I mean. Community's important. I mean, yeah. I learned that then. I'm trying keeping it alive now. Yeah. yeah, and uh, sharing information was so important. Um, there were things, you know, that one person knew that another person didn't and vice versa. I, I just learned so much from being in that comics group. Um, I learned how to, you know, prepare my comic to go to the printer. I learned how to draw perspective. I learned <laughs> <laughs> about Fact Sheet 5. And so, yeah, the, it is still, it's always very solitary. Uh, doing this kind of creative work. Um, but like Tom said, you know, we're still talking to each other on Instagram or whatever. And um, Seattle has continued a real in-person comics community. There's, there's like a weekly or monthly, I guess, drawing night where everybody meets at a cafe and it's very inclusive. Everyone's invited and they make mini comics then derived from what, what, what comics were drawn that night. And yeah, I think Jenny also alluded to this as like, there is a sort of tradition in comics, I don't know if you call it a tradition, but of inclusiveness and like welcoming, welcoming everyone. It's like a more proletariat type of um, <laughs> art, I guess. Um, and so yeah. a lot of people that were associated with it, like musicians or punk rock people or things like that, or people who were like, there should be no barrier to exchanging art um, in that attitude. So, um. yeah, a lot of a lot of my writer friends back then were like, "You cartoonists are so nice to each other. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we're always sniping at each other and keeping each other out of each other's parties." And stuff. You're like, well, only one person has the long arm stapler, right. so we have to stay in the good graces <laughs> of that person. <laughs> Um, a lot of you have gone on to kind of make more long form work. Um, Ariel, you just published a graphic memoir, I guess you could call it, um, with Cluttered. And Tom, you also have a graphic memoir. So I'm interested in what the difference is between making a zine and making something that's a graphic novel, a graphic memoir, or something that's more long form, if there even is a difference. answer to that? I, don't. I feel like the answer is, <laughs> at least for me, is like, if you go with a publisher, or it's more, especially if you go with a publisher, you just have more people to disappoint if you do something wonky. <laughs> but if you publish yourself, you can do whatever the hell you want, mm. however wonky you want it. So I, I don't know, I really like wonky. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do both. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm better at one than the other. I will say that I think the, um, the, the 
move, like the sort of indie comics sort of move towards more and more graphic novel publishing is, you know, of course great, obviously great, um, but as far as just being a creator and thinking in those terms, that's not, it's, um, it's much harder for me to think long term. I, ca I can't really write uh, long form stuff and so that's why Clutter is sort of a scatterbrained collection of uh, short little vignettes um, and uh, if I finally kind of realized that about myself, like yeah, I, I guess that's just, I like writing in short bursts. Um, but I, I don't know, it's like, uh, yeah, I think it's kind of what you said, like you, like anything goes, I still like doing occasional, like especially like like really quickie little one page zines and stuff just to get something off my mind or I don't know. <laughs> Do you feel, Megan, you work with Fanographics, you got a bunch of books out from them. Do you feel like you are free to be, my word was wonky, but like are you able to be Megan in those collections or, you know what I mean? Well, I. I felt a little weird, to be honest, about being invited on this panel because I feel like my my time of, well, I self-published for like six years maybe, I guess, but a lot of people like you guys and John P. have are still at it, Aaron Comet Bus, and I gave that up a long time <laughs> ago, and partly because I, the the process of making the mini comics, um, while I can think back fondly to my time at Kinko's, <laughs> uh, I I also found it stressful and and often distracting. Like when I was making Artichoke Tales, I started out making each chapter as a mini comic, um, but at a certain point, it started to feel like a distraction, like I kind of just wanted to like put my head down and just finish the book and not keep thinking about chunks that would make sense to put out. So I kind of feel like... The so it sounds like a pretty organic transition. I kind of feel like Tom and I are very different in that regard. Like I, I sort of want to like put my head down and do it until it's a complete thing. Mm. I'm a little less comfortable with just throwing <laughs> throwing stuff out there. I and I stuff. really admire those of you who do. And I wish I could, I you know, I, I like John Porcelino. I mean, when I say throw stuff out there, I don't mean that it's like less wonderful. It's just <laughs> a, a bravery kind of that I don't feel like I have. John's a real perfectionist though. When yeah. I get my, like I still self-publish, but I don't do all the stapling and photocopying anymore. I usually send it to a digital printer because they've gotten both professional and cheap enough that it's easy to do. Mm, I need to look into that. But I still <laughs> like, when I get it back and I notice the first typo, I'm like, yes, good, a typo, right? <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> There's still the edge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Megan, as you were speaking, I was thinking about how like in Girl Hero, there's kind of this ongoing story, whoops, <laughs> um, that's, and did you write that story, the bottle cap story, all at the same time, or was it you were writing it as the issues came out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I didn't know I didn't know where I was going <laughs> with that story. <laughs> I don't know if that comes across, but yeah, I was sort of figuring it out as I went, and I felt trapped by it. Um, yeah, it was it was highly ambitious, and it was my first foray into comics, and I pictured this like epic that would like bring together labor politics and feminism and and I uh, um, <laughs> I bit off a lot and and I kind of painted myself into some narrative corners and I I grew to to like be so much happier doing the short stories that were like the other half of each issue of Girl Hero and Bottle Cap started to feel like this millstone around my neck and really scared me off of long form stories for many years. And I really, d after Girl Hero, just did short stories until I started Artichoke Tales. Um, so yeah, I, I learned a lot from that experience. Um, but I, I sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll 
be doing an event and someone will come up to me, someone quite young will come up to me and they'll say, I have this like, you know, 25 chapter space opera comic that I got all <laughs> planned out and I'm like, okay, well, Bless good you. luck with good it. Luck. Good luck. Bless your heart. <laughs> but, um, Mark Cunningham's War World. He was like starting over it over and again. Never we're actually finishing it. <laughs> Sometimes it's like not good to be too, start with something too ambitious, right? Yeah. What was the reaction that you all were getting as you started publishing your zines? Um, Ariel with Deep Girl, Megan with Girl Hero, Jenny with Strange Gross, and then you, Tom, with Hutch Owen. Because um, some, of, some of the material can be shocking at times or like very visceral. Um, so I'm just interested in what that reaction from readers was like. Or were you just mostly working with your friends and hyping each other up, that sort of thing? <laughs> I was I was like surprised I was surprised by the reaction I, I mean um, that uh, people thought my comic was funny and I I mean happily surprised and I think that that gave me like way too much like my ego like exploded really fast I was like oh boy now I really want to try to be funny and and uh, you know like that was one that was one like element of reaction what other kinds of like things, reaction thing. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, I was it, mostly doing it to like gain friends and be liked, so <laughs> I would just... Influence people. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, you know, I did it for my friends, so if like Megan and John liked it, then I was happy, and if more, a couple more people read it and liked it, I was happy. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do anything very visceral, I don't think. So, uh, 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 like a weird, uncomfortable reaction sometimes would be like um, just being female in this very male space at the time was like, um, you know, I get a lot of like pervy weird letters and. Um, See, I didn't get those. So. Yeah. <laughs> I don't Lucky know. you. <laughs> uh, so when I started doing Girl Hero, it was right around the time that Bikini Kill was blowing up. And one of the things they did, it wasn't even like a zine, it was literally a piece of paper that they handed out at shows that was like a list of zines and, and comics made by women and their addresses where you could order them. And I, I made it onto the list. I don't remember submitting it or it just happened. And I, so I had this wonderful mail order operation and it wasn't like I was making a ton of money, but I was regularly getting orders from mostly young women, girl, teenage girls all over the country. It was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And some, sometimes they'd say, like, I got this at a Bikini Kill show. Uh, your comic sounds cool. And sometimes it was just an order. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes they would send me their zine. And I mean, I, I still know some of these people. So there was that, but then there was like, I was learning about the comics world too and starting to go to comic shows. I even went to San Diego with my first <laughs> self-published girl hero. <laughs> <laughs> and that was such a different world. I, the, 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 the disparity at the time between the like, like fact, sheet Con, fi fact Sheet 5, Riot Girl, punk rock zine world and then the comics world, there wasn't the, I don't know, SPX didn't exist yet. There wasn't quite the, the, the sort of show in person equivalent of what I was experiencing from a mail order perspective. So I felt like I had a double life as a self-publisher mm -hmm. kind of. That makes sense because yeah, like there was there wasn't really a venue for self-published independent comics until you know shows like SPX started or Ape, Ape. in yeah, yeah in San Diego. Um, I had a question related to that. Now it's just flew out of my mind. But so, what is the kind of where did comics fit into Zine World? Because 
not every zine obviously is a comic. Um, so were people who were very interested in zines, were they seeing your comics and being like, this is so new or different or interesting? Or what? how did that, what was that relationship like? Or what was trying to like navigate these two worlds, comics world versus zine world like? Well, uh, to answer to that, like um, when I first started doing comics and zines, I actually wasn't really hyper-focused on comics. And so I was contributing and buying zines that were not just comics. Mm. So a lot of them were more like, I guess, art zines, where they'd be a combination of writing and art and different things like that. Like yeah. Backwoods was one of them. Um, and there are White Buffalo Gazette. Well, that's mostly comics. Um, Salon. Um, so... I think when I first started, I wasn't really quite sure what I wanted to do with it, and I liked all of it, and so I was like submitting things that were just writing to some places, and then I was also doing comics and stuff like that. Um, so for me, I don't see it as a big dividing line that one is one thing and one thing's another. I think a lot of the same people were working actually in both arty type magazines and doing comics at the same time. I think it's really nice now that there's like this blend, like where there's, you know, comics and zines and art books and there's space for everything and there's so many more printing options. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very different kind of feeling environment. But I, I think you put it really well, like Megan, all the, uh, all the, that kind of two worlds. And to be honest, I was kind of, I was so much more like I identified more as a cartoonist than a zine maker. Um, I, I, I didn't really want people to call my comic a zine at the time. I was like, mm -hmm. it's a mini comic. <laughs> Excuse me. No, but I, I, I just, um, and I, I, I really love trading zines with people. I loved when I got them. Um, and there were a few that I really connected with. Uh, but I was, often a little bit just like, hmm, tech scene. Like, <laughs> honestly, I think I have a little bit of, a, a little bit of trouble reading uh, the, the really, really text-heavy blocks, um, uh, in especially handwritten. Uh, so maybe that's part of the reason. It's shrunk and it's way too small. And it yeah. Just be like <laughs> now I can't really read <laughs> scenes at all. Yeah. No. no, but I mean, I like them. I've, I've come around to kind of loving zines, but it kind of took me some time of being a little like snotty young person. For <laughs> You're like, I'm doing comics, not <laughs> zines. <No. laughs> um, well, since I, I, I was inspired by the zines I saw, and I didn't know that mini comics was a thing until I later moved to Seattle, I, from the very beginning, um, I contributed comics to people's zines. And, and I loved that because often, because zines often were very wordy, they they were often like really excited to um, have a comic, and so I kind of text. yeah to break up the. Mm -hmm. So I um, basically for many years did a lot of one-page comics that that had originated because someone who whose zine I liked uh, and we corresponded or whatever, you know, asked me if I would contribute a one-page comic, and I really. I, I always really liked that because I became much more of a comics world person pretty fast, and I liked sort of having that kind of connection to the zine side of things um, from occasionally contributing. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, why is self-publishing still important today? It's like my big question, and I, because I believe in self-publishing so ardently, and I just want to hear from you all why it's still necessary um, when there are so many independent publishers or people to work with, or just post your stuff on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm not the best person to answer this, but um, for me, just personally, I like having something physical to hold to read. So there's a lot of people that are like in a sense, publishing things through Instagrams or blog posts. Um, there's a lot of, there's just more stuff out there than there ever was before. 
but I still think there's something special about getting something in the mail or exchanging things and having something physical or tangible to exchange um, that, again, is not something that maybe a publisher would be interested in making a thousand copies of, but you still want to share that with people, you know, so that's why I like to do it. I've sort of been embracing self-publishing lately because I'm trying, um, the work I've been doing is just so hostily strange and like I don't even want to try, like if four people read it, I'd be happy. They just have to be the right four. <laughs> um, and so self-publishing is the only way I thought I think to go. And that's why, like what I mentioned about typos and stuff. It's like I, I, I want it to be really rough around the edges. And like so if, when I do notice a typo that I didn't know about, I'm like, oh, good, that's good. And so I don't know, part of me really wants to experiment with, I've always been so anti-corporate, right? And there's a polished look to everything. And so part of me wants to be, wants to. Like pushing against that. Yeah, yeah, no, I just want to like, let's make something human and wrong, let's just do that. You know, so part of me is still trying to do that, but at the same time, I'm also trying to run this business that actually is uh, quite difficult to do from a rough around the edges kind of standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sort of like allowing myself that little private space to self-publish and make this wonky thing. Um, and I encourage it all the time in my students too, but um, and some, some take me up on it and make really interesting, bizarre, organic and very, um, very personal work, and others are still like, no, I want to get an agent. How do I get an agent and get a Simon Schuster deal and stuff like that? But, but, um, but in general, to me, especially as the world just feels like it's collapsing around us, I just want more weird things from weird people. Human connection. Yeah. Yeah. Zoom or comics. Def definitely, those like all of that. <laughs> totally agree with all of that, and and also just I feel I feel like it's always really, really important for democracy to have like a, a way to disseminate information without any gatekeeping or, you know, and also if you have a, a pamphlet and um, you have not put it on the internet, you can say literally whatever the hell you want. <laughs> no one can stop you. Yeah. You know, there's, uh, there, if, especially if you if you go to self service printing, <laughs> if you don't go to self service printing, then there's another like somebody pair of eyes that could censor you. But um, I love that about it. Yeah, I think that we're sometimes because it's so easy to like make an Instagram post or write a Facebook post or write a tweet. We're losing sight of um, how freeing it can be to print something that is not affiliated with these like big tech companies and. You know, isn't oh, technically owned by anyone but you. Like so, five hundred years later, you know, they're gonna dig this out. And <laughs> like, where did this come from? You know, it's mm -hmm. not gonna happen on Instagram. Yeah. I also think there's something to be said for the experience of um, making a publication, which is very, very different from posting like a serial comic on Instagram. I mean totally legit way to get into comics. But making a, a paper publication where you have to think about, OK, what's the cover? What's the inside cover? What's the back cover? What's the back inside cover? And, and thinking of it as this, as this unit unto itself, is, it's just very, very different than, um, than like posts. It, I, it's hard, hard to articulate, but like, as an artist and creator, um, thinking that way, I think it is important. Not that you have to always do it that way, but it's I think an important growth experience, mm -hmm. at helping you figure out your voice and, you know, what you're about. Um, also, I I'm from Seattle. I'm on the board of Short Run, which is a comics and arts festival that's been going on for the last 10 years in Seattle. I'm wearing a Short Run t-shirt today. <laughs> and uh, we focus really hard on individual creators who are making books of some sort. There's a few publishers, but it's mostly individuals. And there is just nothing like being in a giant room of of individual people at tables who made their own thing, and there they are in front of you. And 
I don't know, it creates a buzz of energy that's like nothing else. And it's interesting how I don't I don't really go to zine festivals much, but it seems like there's a real renaissance of zine festivals these days. And mm -hmm. I I have to believe that it's the same thing that we all get from short run that like there's just something so important about the community that comes together because you have to go to a place to get the little book. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you, Rachel. Yeah, I, I think it's important to kind of reinforce why print matters, especially with so much now that's digital that we just have access to at our fingertips. So I really appreciate hearing from you all why print is important. Um, Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to audience questions in a moment, but I wanna get a final vote. Are we calling them zines or mini comics? <laughs> Which is it? In 2022? Yes, I, I need to know for my... <laughs> We're gonna settle it now. We see lots of different things, while mini comics only have to do with comics. So I think zine is a bigger, more inclusive term of those photocopies type magazines. And I would agree, but what does everyone else think, too? I don't care. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, they're called zines. Someone says, you do zines? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I, had to, I had to eventually embrace zines as the more inclusive term. Like, um, I was a, a buyer for a while uh, of oh, the, for a zine collection, and um, I wanted to call it like something, maybe the zine and mini comic library or something, but then I was really like, yeah, just, they're all zines. They're <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're all zines. It's like when they were trying to come up with alternatives for the graphic novel, you'd get pretentious, but also I ironic names like, it's a picto novel, <laughs> grapho fiction oh, graph. Why was this a big controversy? Some people hated the term graphic novel, and they're like, we cannot use that word. We yeah. need to create our own word. What was that all about? That's something I like about comics, though, is like we can never decide on what terms to call things. So <laughs> we're just like, I don't know. I just made it. It is what it is. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Um, if anyone ha in the audience has questions for our amazing panelists, I think there are uh, microphones on either side here. So um, you can raise your hand, get up, and go to the mic or whatever works for you all. I will try to organize if anyone has any questions at all. Okay, we're doing hand raising. So I saw Cyrus's <laughs> hand and then your hand, so. Now is that okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, it's really cool hearing the long sort of story of you all's experience with art and, and comics and everything. And I was curious, sort of like you talked some about initially what you came into comics looking for, sort of friends and connecting with people and sharing your ideas and being heard. Uh, I was curious, sort of. And this is maybe too big of a question, but. Um, how have you seen that really like transform? Like right now, what do you feel like you're looking for when you're self-publishing or when you're creating any art? Like what do you feel like you're looking for now versus what you remember looking for when you started out? I've always 
I've always, for myself, thought of comics as a storytelling vehicle. Um, and I always have way more plans for stories than I, than I have time and energy to make. I'm, I'm a pretty slow cartoonist. Um, so there's always a backlog of, of things I want to do. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't self-publish anymore, although I occasionally put out a mini-comic, um, which is a good reminder to myself, because I, I don't know about you guys, but like, you know, I always think like, well, what, when the apocalypse comes, like how, whatever form that's in, like, I, I, I'll be like the town scribe or whatever. <laughs> I know how to draw stuff, I can keep it going, I can keep it going. I always worry about losing, like, I never think about, like, oh, this is going to be my role in the apocalypse. I'm just like, where are my glasses going to be? Like, are they going to survive? <laughs> Will I be able to see? <laughs> yes. I kind of discovered through, uh, like, for a couple of years I was keeping a daily diary comic, and I kind of discovered, oh, like, it, it just helps me keep myself sane. It, it helps me just sort of, like, put um, the, you know, scribbled insanity that's going on in my head every day um, into these, like, neat little boxes, and it, it just helps, like, it's like meditation to me now. Not that I do the daily thing right now, but it just, yeah. Okay, we're getting very, very close to time, so I'm going to go with our second hand raise and everyone else who does have questions. You all are tabling, right? So they can find you at your tables. Their tables are listed in the front room. Yeah, so we'll go with our last question over here. Test, okay. Um, so a lot of the appeal of zines, especially in the 90s, is uh, how accessible they were and the forms that were accessible, such as like Xerox machines. And then like, uh, as time went on, more things become accessible, like at-home computers, uh, programs, stuff like that, um, at-home printing. Uh, do you feel like these new like revolutions in technology were actually met with resistance and kind of like a preservation to save the old ways, the old techniques and methods and forms of the art form? Or, yeah. Question. Neither did I. So, uh, <laughs> so I guess uh, a lot of things are now accessible, like colored printing and like at home, like Photoshop. Yeah. Do you think that was met with resistance and people trying to preserve things like photocopying? Thank you all so much. This is lovely. So I hope you guys will join me in thanking our panelists.